name's Doug Silver, and I have the honor today of interviewing Ta Lee for AIME's Oral History Program. Hi, Ta. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Let's start with your youth. Tell me where you grew up. Yeah, I'd love to. I was really born in New York City at Women's Hospital in Manhattan. June 25th, 1948, so I'm really an old timer. Uh, being raised in New York City encouraged me to play city sports, stickball, handball, baseball, and softball. I lived in various locations, primarily in Manhattan and Queens, New York. The latter six years was in Jackson Heights, which was primarily a Jewish community. That comes to bite you on Jewish holidays because uh, the only people that showed up in class was this Asian gal, or Chinese gal then, and uh, myself. So uh, after the first Jewish holiday, uh, I tended to play hooky every other Jewish holiday <laughs> and spend my time uh, where they were off to. <laughs> uh, I've always had a Facebook um, page, and uh, it's really useful because I found out that I reconnected with a lot of my people or friends from eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth grade. And uh, it's been uh, remarkable to see that a lot of them that I thought would end up in jail, you know, actually went to MIT and Harvard and are very important people like myself. So, <laughs> And uh, when I got to junior high school, I took the special exam, New York City high school exam, which is controversial now and got into Brooklyn Technical High School. I commuted by subway to the high school. I graduated three years from a four-year program by going to summer school. And the high school was an outstanding STEM high school with a focus on engineering. That's fascinating. And your parents have a very interesting history. Um, did they also go to college? And, and what did your parents do for a living? Yeah, both of my parents came from China uh, my dad was the scholar, majored in English, uh, and uh, basically they came over to the United States in 1947, uh, before liberation, and he went to Columbia, Columbia Teachers College on a fellowship. My uh, dad received his BA from Southwest Teachers College in Kuming, China, Southwest, and my mom worked as a nurse in China having been trained by U.S. missionaries. Uh, upon my dad's graduation from Columbia in 49, 1949, he went to work for the Chinese News Service, which was, a, uh, was not really a news service, but a propaganda machine uh, for the Republic of China and Chiang Kai-shek. He couldn't work for any U.S. firms because, or companies because he was uh, uh, didn't have a green card. You know, elements of the Chinese Exclusion Act were still prominent, although changing because the Republic of China became a U.S. ally in World War II. Uh, it wasn't getting anywhere because uh, everybody who was in this propaganda, the, the, the real heavies came from uh, the Republic of China, and so uh, he was often bypassed for a promotion to the t top job in the U.S. Uh, so basically, he returned part-time night school to Columbia in 1958 and obtained his MS in library science and got a job as a reference librarian at Princeton. Uh, it's interesting to note that he really, that wasn't his first choice. He would rather uh, have worked for a public library system and uh, interact with uh, all sorts of adults in uh, America, the company that he adopted. Uh, but his advisor at Columbia said, well, you, you, you have knowledge of the Chinese language. And the guest Oriental Library, which was very famous at that time, he became a reference librarian there, and that's where he went. Princeton secured eventual U.S. citizenship for my mom and my brother. Uh, I was born in the U.S., so... Uh, I didn't have to go through that, I guess. Uh, my mom worked in the garment industry in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. And when my dad moved to Princeton, she moved along and she actually commuted through Lawrenceville and uh, 
and worked in, on 8th Avenue for many years, you know, and uh, joined the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and uh, really enjoyed that type of work. I've known you for at least 40 years, and uh, you have a great family. Tell us about them. Yeah, well, first of all, my wife of 52 years, too young lady, most of you probably know her. Uh, she had various jobs in accounting, insurance, project controls, and recently retired as an office manager for Orion Mine Finance, their Denver office. Uh, we met at Hunter College at a dance mixer. We've been together since 1967. She graduated from the University of Utah in 1977, delayed by marriage and us moving to our first job. And she was very supportive of mining career while concurrently establishing her career in administration with mining mineral industry entities. While both of us are originally from New York, we lived in Salt Lake City and Denver for the past 50 years or so. We have a son, Ta Ming, He's now 50 years old. He received his B.S. in geophysics from Southern Methodist University and continues to reside in Dallas, Texas. Still single, he keeps steady company with a girlfriend of eight years. And of all things, he chose to be a wildcat oil specialist, punching holes in Texas, New Mexico, Louisiana, and Ohio. Their basic business model is to drill where uh, in the U.S. targets that uh, were depleted from shallow oil production and punch in uh, deeper holes. And he's been uh, somewhat successful because, uh, but he's not a J.R. Ewing yet, and I'm still waiting. I have an older brother who was a great mentor in my early professional life, having preceded me both in high school and college. He worked as an IT specialist in data processing and information systems for Unisys and travel companies. He currently lives in Nassau County, New York. Two are living the good life, and uh, traveling was always big for us, uh, and we did continue and go to places on our bucket list. Most recently in Bali, Indonesia, in November uh, 2019, if we wait another three months, that would have all been kibosh with the COVID. So your son is Ta Lee too? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That joke got uh, old after five years of that. You're not the first American that noticed that. <laughs> I'm observant, what can I say? You got a BS uh, degree in mining engineering. How did you decide to go into that field? Yeah, I guess uh, growing up Chinese, and now we're Asian Americans in the U.S., we, are, we were always told that we'd be relegated to becoming a, a renowned scientist or engineer or work in the laundry inn or restaurant. We could also be an economist uh, after uh, Doug here. Uh, an AIME careers booklet on mining and metallurgy caught my attention and guided me to the earth sciences. While I wrote most of the mining schools, my per parental pressures necessitated, necessitated me to focus on Ivy League schools. Ultimately, I applied to Columbia University uh, in mining and the University of Pennsylvania in metallurgy. Biggest obstacle to getting admitted was the fact that my SATs weren't anywhere near what they required. Also, because Asians didn't focus on extracurricular activities, college admissions departments usually scored negatively in their applications. But I real, by realizing that, I spent a lot of time in those areas. To enhance my chances for admission to these top schools, uh, I made site visits with my mother and met with the respective department heads. And at Columbia, they didn't have a lot of people interested in mining. And at Penn, there wasn't anybody interested in metallurgy. So my focus in this uh, area was based on go where they ain't. And I got admitted to both schools with generous scholarships. They were awarded not because of any brilliance, but because they are less populated by applicants. So chose Columbia, 
struggled with studies, focused on extracurricular activities, and finally graduated with a BS in mining engineering. What and who were the most influences in pursuing an engineering degree? Yeah, I guess uh, if you looked at all uh, the articles that were around, there were tremendous opportunities in the mining field. In 1965, there were actually only 150 graduates for the 300 plus jobs. Starting salaries were atrocious and small, but yeah, interestingly at the time, graduate studies and, or, and degrees translated into being overqualified and was actually a disadvantage in securing a employment. Exception was if you wanted to go into research. During my junior and senior years, scholarships were plentiful, but they were limited to top students. Not being one, I always struggled to stay afloat. Later in my career, I always focused on bottom-up students. And when I was chairman of the scholarship committee for uh, the Colorado section, uh, I basically uh, uh, selected the uh, applicants from the bottom up because the top down always had opportunities and had plenty of money. Uh, but, you know, those that were in the middle, uh, like myself or lower, uh, basically never got anything. So the other thing that influenced me were my summer jobs in the mineral industry fueled the interest in mining. My first summer job was at the Sterling Hill underground zinc mine in Ogdensburg, New Jersey. Uh, amazing. Uh, we started at $1.87 an hour for training for the first week, and then we got raised to $2.07 an hour as a miner's helper. Another summer job uh, was at a perophyllite open pit mine for a standard minerals company in Robbins, uh, North Carolina. That job I got through uh, an AIME jobs list in those years, uh, they did that. And uh, I was lucky to spot it. And then, uh, yeah, it was a great experience in Robbins, North Carolina. They seen very few Asians uh, in those days. And I can remember getting off in Bisco, North Carolina, and uh, everybody gawking at me. But uh, we got over that. It was a... Uh, it, the interesting story there was uh, they really didn't know. So I figured out, because I, I do have some street sense, I went to the local church that first Sunday. I popped out $20 and made sure everybody saw I put $20 in the, in the offering plate. And uh, next Monday when I went to work, everybody saying, hi, Todd, how are you? So, you know, it's uh, really cool. The other influence... Uh, was Pete Zabo, uh, Columbia classmate. Uh, he was with me in high school, in college, and into the first years of my career. His thing was a, a rock in the box, pays the wage, and gave me that phrase that mining is the only business where you start at the top and work your way down. <laughs> Did you have to take any additional coursework? No, it's kind of interesting there. As I said before, I wasn't uh, on the real dean's list. I was kind of floating around the other one. And I wanted to go to business school when I graduated, but my college advisor knew. And he said he told me to get to work, and get some experience. He sur surmised that business school wouldn't do me any good. Uh, additional coursework. You know, with all the time I spent on college extracurricular activity, that probably constituted as an uh, additional course. I would venture to say my load in this area was as, as significant as my coursework. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of priorities. So, you know, I was involved in student council, class officers, uh, Theta Tau, and et cetera. Finally, uh, volunteer work in my local communities uh, it was kind of a course, and uh, I did some tutoring in East Harlem, but honestly, that reminded me of my early childhood, and I really didn't want to go there. Did you have any of your professors mentor you in any way? 
Yeah, there were, all my professors mentored us, because there was only two of us in the class. And uh, the two guys that kind of per offset come to an immediate mind was this K.P. Wang, who was an adjunct professor and China expert for the U.S. Bureau of Mines. He taught us uh, mineral economics, but most importantly, emphasized our information network so that even if you didn't know the answer, you'd always have the means to find out. He also uh, made contacts and helped me with my first China trip, which I discuss a little later. Stefan Boschkoff was the department head of the Henry Crum School of Mines at Columbia. You know, when I went to see him, he worked to influence the admission department to accept me into Columbia. Uh, after years on the dean's list, uh, encouraged me to continue despite my academic problems. Through the mining summer field program, we did underground surveying in Belfont, Pennsylvania, next to another renowned mining school, as well as visits to coal mines and metal mines in North America. That summer, we gained our street smarts, which was of great value later in our professional career. Did you have any classmates that influenced your studies as a career? Sure. Alan Silverstein was my roommate and majored in metallurgy at the Henry Kerm School of Mines. We became lifelong friends, and he always assisted me in my professional career as well as in college. Alan went to Harvard Business School and was very successful in the retail banking space. Uh, later on in life, uh, well, early in life when we were in college, we had the Columbia disruptions in 1968. And so it came, occurred to me that was a great opportunity. And we actually put together an Ivy League engineering conference that focused on the social responsibility of engineers and sustainability. We had 20 people from each school, uh, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton, uh, and the uh, lesser Ivies. <laughs> That's pretty editorial there. <laughs> and uh, basically, we talked about uh, current issues. And uh, the other part of Alan's friendship, too, was when I was in a junior company and I wanted to check a checking account for you know, day to day, he actually introduced me to a guy, uh, a colleague of his from Norwest Bank. And basically, uh, you know, I mean, all we want, we didn't have any money, we didn't have any uh, assets yet. And I met with him, and he said that uh, being recommended by Alan, we can immediately give you a $5 million credit line. And, uh, and then assigned, amazingly, a private banker to us. <laughs> I said, wow. <laughs> and that proves handy later on as we executed our business plan at uh, the junior company. Moving on again, the uh, Pete Zabo, uh, he was, uh, uh, was a classmate, which I talked about previously, and gave me great advice throughout my studies and early professional career. When I became president of SME, I was looking at every picture of all the past presidents, and I thought, maybe I should take a picture of me in a golf jersey and, you know, swinging a club or, you know. And he gave me the perspective that uh, that might be cute, but that's not really appropriate. He says, you gotta think from 50 to 100 years from now, there'll be students that are studying the mining business. And part of that would be to look at Mining Engineering Magazine because it is a principal mining publication. He says, when people look at your picture with a, with a golf club in your hand, that might be appropriate. So think of how you want to be remembered in eternity. So that, that's why I have such an impressive picture now uh, from mining engineering. It had nothing to do then with your golf swing. Uh, I had a better one then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and uh, the other, my brother was a great influence. And the final guy that was Daryl Goodrich, and he was the other mining engineering student. He tutored me in my mining courses, and I reciprocated in helping him to leadership positions and extracurricular activities. We reminisced a lot about that exchange in our 50th reunion in 2019.
You mentioned having uh, summer jobs in the mining industry. What did you get from your summer jobs that you didn't get from academia? Oh, that, that there was a whole new area of learning that we had to do, getting along with miners. I joined the union for the experience at New Jersey Zinc, quality control engineer. Uh, you really learned to work with people uh, and tolerate people too, because they're, they're, you know, you have the college graduates that are on a plane, and you have other people that are on a different plane. So, anyway, the uh, summer jobs helped my career again, seating me with both relationships and a perspective on management and hands-on experience for the mining production cycle. During the late 60s, there was a lot going on in America. Uh, did any of the political or cultural events affect you in your studies? Yeah, there were, they, you know, there were a lot of things, uh, and every year I attend, there was a different problem. Uh, one of the great things we did uh, for the Chinese then, but uh, we, be we basically got together with three or four guys that didn't really want to join the traditional club. So we formed something called the Dragon Society. And it was organized to uh, put together first generation Asian Americans in the university environment. One of the immediate lessons we learned was that as a student, we could actually organize activities that could make a profit. So we, we did this Oriental Arts Festival. We showed uh, movies in the uh, Student Activities Center. And one in particular I remember was uh, the movie Monica, uh, one of Bergman's uh, classic uh, movies. In the publicity, maybe this is my knack for uh, marketing, we actually put a flyer together which showed Monica, uh, Monica's cleavage from the back. And uh, you put that around campus, and uh, the first and second showings were both uh, sold out. And the, after the first, and it's amazing how fickle people are, because uh, the first showing, people coming out says, it's not a porn film, <laughs> it's, it's, it's something different. And the second showing line said, yeah, you're just BSing us. And they all came in and filled that up. And we made a ton of money doing those kind of activities. So in the bylaws of the, the Dragon Society, uh, basically, uh, we, had, we made sure, because drinking was only 18 in New York at that time, we had alcohol was a must for every Dragon Society meeting. So we got a lot of white guys in the, the club too, so that was kind of neat. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I attended Columbia from 65 to 69, and what one would remember the student protests at Columbia, it really had an uh, impact in my life. Uh, Engineers continued to study while the campus was held hostage. Student unrest let me, oh yeah, so uh, that was kind of a, uh, an amazing realization. And because I was uh, not one of the brightest students, you know, I kind of held out a sign and protested uh, along with the other guys. And I remember my mechanics of solids professor coming up to me and saying, well, I know why you're protesting. <laughs> so, so it was kind of an uh, amazing time. Uh, and like I say, the, that student unrest, as I said earlier, uh, made me to conceive and uh, do this Ivy League engineering conference. And uh, it convened uh, on campus during National Engineers Week in 1969. And we had uh, Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall, uh, famed architect Percival Goodman, and Bob Lilly, uh, who was the uh, president of New Jersey Bell as, as speakers. On graduation, they had the draft lottery, and I drew a low number, 124. So I, uh, anyway, I took a full day physical at the induction center in Manhattan and uh, like uh, Muhammad Ali uh, failed. So uh, I was ready to go to work somewhere. In 1968-69, many mining companies had headquarters in New York, 
But the Vietnam War era was a deterrent to hiring new graduates. You know, essentially, uh, they weren't, they didn't uh, hire us because they think we, we were going there for uh, draft deferments. So how did you get your first job then? Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I interviewed a lot of companies. They were in New York, Anaconda, Amax, St. Joe, Copper Range, uh, outside Consolidation Coal, Island Creek Coal, uh, New Jersey Zinc, Phelps Dodge, and Kennecott Copper. Kennecott was most receptive to my career goals that mining engineers should also be working in non-traditional areas of public relations, sales, and marketing. So I got the site visit to, or interview visit to the Utah Copper Division of Kennecott, where being Asian, I was sworn with engineering and computer personnel. I mean, uh, you know, I guess Asians were the brains of that aspect of the business. Uh, you know, everybody, when, the, when I made the comment, well, I'm not really interested in doing engineering here. Now, oh, nice to see you. Uh, you know, and pass me along to the last guy, next guy. The final interview was uh, mine manager, Tom Carlson from Michigan Tech, who ultimately, when asked, uh, what would you like to do? Uh, I told him, anything short of slavery. <laughs> and he ultimately uh, gave me the offer to become a production supervisor. And my wife and I were off to Bingham Canyon, Utah. What year was that, roughly? 1970, May. So what facilities did Utah Copper Division have that, that made it a good job? Yeah, I mean, Utah Copper Division was typical big company and uh, integrated production centers. So it was an excellent, excellent place to learn. The integrated mine production included an open pit mine, 115,000 tons per day ore, a stripping ratio three and a half to one, it had both rail and truck haulage operations, had a concentrator where it's busy crushing, grinding, flotation, had a conventional smelter, and precious metals in Mali recovery plant, and the copper uh, precipitation plant. Supporting mine and engineer, industrial engineering groups were there. They had extensive waste and tailings facilities. Everything you wanted to know about mining was contained in this division. And I remember commenting to the wife, we were really fortunate that we were able to come here because of its proximity to Salt Lake City, a large metro area, versus other remote mining locations. So the first few years of your career, you were working as a production supervisor at the open pit. What were the responsibilities and, and how much staff reported to you? Well, I started as a rotary drill shift foreman. Bingham Canyon produced 14% of the U.S. primary copper in 1969-70. And um, I was responsible for half the drilling fleet. So I surmised that I drill and blasted 7% of the nation's copper. <laughs> Blasting shift foreman, that was a tougher job. But luckily, I was mentored by uh, outstanding blasting foreman. And I was a truck shift foreman. Uh, attitudes of peer group towards a uh, college graduate was, uh, some, was an obstacle easily overcome uh, once you understood uh, what they were trying to do. Sustaining production at each uh, work center basically was uh, a big part of my job, solving day-to-day -day problems. Safety first was on the minds of everybody. We had to keep an ongoing safety education program with them. Uh, seniority, even among our uh, newly college graduate, was key components for operations personnel. And here I had an extended introduction to graveyard shift. <laughs> so how did Kennecott provide you a, a, with a foundation for the rest of your career? Yeah, it actually helped me both in the mining communications area as well as the engineering, consulting, construction, and contract mining. Continue building people skills to all levels of workers that really supported my future managerial skills. 
Did you find it difficult to convert from college into the mining world? Not really. Uh, you know, we needed to have practical knowledge, street smarts as well as book smarts. Uh, the transition included building a sense of urgency in everything we did. And uh, you needed to know people and the processes to get things done. Uh, establishing respectful, respectful relationships with coworkers was a key requirement for that success. And what was your biggest challenges in adapting to working in heavy industry? Well, I think the most challenge, the big realization that you don't have forever to solve problems. Each unit is dependent on each other and uh, solutions needed immediately because if your area of responsibility goes down, subsequent unit operations also shut down. And you had to do some risk taking, uh, uh, which is important to an engineer and production supervisor. Overcoming, uh, we do this as it was, as it always has been done, uh, was another obstacle and a challenge, but because that inhibits innovation. Relationships and trust building are important to overcome preconceived established procedures. So what were some of your first major projects? Yeah, I, I suppose mine planning with associated drilling and blasting, uh, basically to keep ahead of the shovel. Truck haulage, it was really to sustain or schedule a balance between trucks and shovels and uh, flexibility to move trucks within the pit when some were uh, queued up too much, too little. Another area where they wanted us to perform was in work simplifications or Kennecott's succession suggestion box. You know, frozen water lines in the winter on drill rigs, uh, re-drill, re-threading drill pipe threads so uh, they would last longer as the rotary drilling process uh, took place. Executing my mine safety procedures and accident reporting, well, I had an ability to write, and so uh, most of the other day, uh, frontline supervisors uh, basically uh, put the writing uh, requirement to me, and I was pretty good at writing, so. The last thing was, uh, what I did in the suggestion box or work simplification is I put in a frontline supervisor's community relations program. While this is a sidebar, it was innovative in the sense that it recognized that frontline foreman had a keen knowledge of the mining process and could be trained to support mining knowledge to their specific neighborhoods and communities. Uh, it was accepted by management but unfortunately, the PR department was charged to execute the program. Not really understanding the mining cycle, the seminars turned into a gripe session instead of an education one. But, I mean, it was good thinking at that point in time. So you, you mentioned that, that part of your job was solving problems, but it sounds like the problems you, you were solving were not things like pit wall failures but just little things that made the operations run better. Yeah, smoothly. Uh, we had, in a big company like Kennecott, you had lots of people in the mining engineering, industrial engineering, that tackled those issues because they were specialists, sort of, and when they weren't, they went outside to consultants. Given your work at Kennecott, what motivated you to leave the mine and become associated with mining publications. How did you make this transition from one sector to the other? Yeah, my, my initial goal in mining was to work and get my hands dirty, understand the process. And after a couple of years in operations, I thought it was time for a change. AIME was a great help. And I requested from my supervisor, paid time off to attend the annual meeting, their annual meeting in San Francisco in 1972. Uh, understand that I didn't ask the company to pay for my trip. I just wanted to be paid for the time off to better myself. And the logical th thinking there is then 
the more I knew, the better off the company would be. So I was off to San Francisco. Uh, at the uh, Caterpillar Hospitality Suite, at the meeting, I made and sold myself to the editor-in-chief of EMJ, a McGraw-Hill publication. Uh, George Luchin, the uh, editor, saw my name badge and was intrigued with all things Bingham. And certainly I could talk about all things Bingham. And so uh, after a while, he said, what did you think of EMJ, which everybody knows? And I said to him quite succinctly, I think you need more engineers to write the magazine instead of English majors, which was a hell of a thing to say. And uh, he said, I like you. And I said, oh, OK. And uh, he said, do you have a business card? And I looked at him, and I uh, rather astounding. I said, you know, they give business cards uh, to certain types of people. I said, I'm a guy that's producing 7% of the nation's blasting 7% of the nation's copper. I said, we're too busy working. They don't give people like me a business card. And uh, he was, became more intrigued. And he says, I like you. And uh, you know, next time you're in New York, why don't you come up and visit? And so uh, I interviewed in New York and was offered a job as assistant editor. Learned technical writing, trade magazine business, the advertising and sales process, and developed tremendous mining contacts at the highest levels. And, you know, I, and I understood the politics of publishing. In 1975, I joined SME in Salt Lake City as technical editor and served briefly as manager of general member services and then became editor-in-chief in 1977. Transitioning to publications included learning by practice that improved my writing skills. At McGraw-Hill, there were plenty of professional writers and uh, art departments, and it was at this time I accelerated my writing and oral communication skills. Ty, uh, you're, you're considered one of the best markers in the business. When, when in your career did you decide or learn that this was actually one of your strongest skills? I guess I, I'm not so sure I know how to answer that question. You know, uh, the, the politically correct answer is I'm still learning. <laughs> and what's the real answer? Uh, I, I guess I always knew it, uh, especially starting getting into college. You know, uh, I, I certainly wasn't on a par with the other students from an SAT class and rank, but uh, I wanted to, I had to go to Columbia because of my family. And uh, you found a way to do it. You know, and yeah, you know, uh, street sense is as important as anything else I've ever done, you know? So what do you consider some of your major accomplishments while you worked in publications? Yeah, you know, I, my ego's big, and uh, I think I did a lot of things. Uh, I did 14 cover stories over a four-year period with these uh, magazines. Uh, I always thought it was important for editors to not just edit, but to build credibility for the magazine uh, by showing the in-house staff had, had, uh, had knowledge and were reporting on major trends uh, in the business. Uh, in 1974, we did a special issue for mining engineering on ocean mining, and rather surprisingly, uh, it was, uh, reprints were ordered by the U.S. House Interior Subcommittee on Deep Ocean Mining to serve as a source document for them. I co-authored those, that special issue with Richard Tinsley, who uh, had a special interest in ocean mining, and uh, we were both going to do that for uh, McGraw-Hill, but we both moved over, or I moved over to Ocean uh, SME, and so Ocean Man SME got to do that article. I also authored two major articles on mining education in the U.S., researching outlooks, starting salaries, types of jobs, and outlook for engineers. And then these issues were published, uh, these articles were published in 1972 and 1977.
1978, I was invited by the U.S. Department of Commerce to lead an equipment seminar trade mission to the Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. Sheldon Winfin, who is the chief mining engineer at the Bureau of Mines, couldn't chair this one as he usually did. And he was a reader of mining engineering and thought, hey, I could do it, you know. And on completion of the trade mission, we authored a special issue on mining in the Far East in April 1978. In 1978, as editor of Mining Engineer, I was invited to visit China through the recommendation with uh, K.P. Wang, my professor mentor. We were invited to go to China and visit several mines and mills, as well as meeting with the principal ministries, coal, gold, iron ore, non-ferrous metals. Uh, we developed special, I developed with Dr. Wang, K.P. Wang, uh, a special issue on China in the April 1979 issue of Mining Engineering. Other special issues were on specific uh, unit operations, Pinot Valley, Eastern Tennessee Zinc, Western U.S. Phosphates, and our bicentennial issue was on the Coeur d'Alene mining uh, and I did an issue on automated ro rotary drilling. In the ensuing years, served as chief editor of four SME proceedings publications, Mineral Resources of the Pacific Rim, Mineral Resource Management by Personal Computer, Risk Assessment in Mines, and Small Mines Development for Precious Metals Development. We, that was the first after SME stopped its uh, fall meeting. Uh, there was a mandate to uh, come up with uh, special topical meetings, and I'm proud to say that uh, we we actually had uh, proceedings which had 100% of the papers, and uh, went to three pu three uh, three publications. Uh, you know, pretty cool for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after I left, I. I also continued, well, I started writing for the Surface Annual Mining Review of Mining Journal in London, as well as the Mining Annu Annual Review for International Mining. Uh, I remember spending all-nighters to meet the deadlines. You mentioned uh, prior that, that you spent some time as SME's manager of general member services. Uh, what did you do in this role? Yeah, I thought it was uh, a detour, but actually general M member services was a broad job f which included services that nobody else in SME wanted to do. Executive Director Claude Crowley at that time placed me in this role from an SME political perspective so that when the top editorial post opened, I would was the only logical choice. I never knew he was that clever, but yeah. Member services included management and administration of local sections and student chapters, membership development, education board, plus the six subcommittees, ABET, and uh, the GEM, Government Energy Minerals, which is now the MEC. Uh, one special project that I conducted was working with the planning committee to put minerals and mining engineering uh, on a national basis. My mining engineering background facilitated the committee to progress more fastly for the exam. Uh, we actually presented with Ernie Spokes, who was at Missouri Mines, to the Universe Uniform Examination and Qualifications Committee in Orlando. Uh, all engineers have egos, and the UEQ members were no different. They thought of mining engineering as not a legitimate engineering based on the two sample exams that were submitted. Uh, they said, you know, beef up the examination and represent to us next year when we were in Louisville. Well, I, I figured out what the problem was and, uh, you know, certain solutions. If you were an engineer, you'd know you'd go to the McNally handbook and get and read off a graph how to uh, solve this Ross and Ramler fluids uh, uh, problem. 
But we just put in a picture of the graph and they said, well, you know, what, what is it to uh, do this? So I took the, I told Ernie, don't worry. I think I understand the problem. And I went back to the exam book and every solution that was less than three pages, uh, it, as in the case of the Ross and Rambler uh, graph, uh, I put in the graph, put in the numbers, expanded the solution to three pages. So now the exam questions were the same, the solutions were the same, but being an engineer, I could make show all the work that might be done. And uh, anyway, I remember in Louisville, the same mechanical engineer that accused us of not being an engineer saw that exam and said, hey, you guys in mining minerals are serious, and uh, I'm voting to have this on the national examination. So uh, that was a behind the scenes story, but uh, there you go. And uh, when, I, when all this was completed by 1979, um, I was appointed SME first member of the professional advisory committee. That's the time when they wanted more citizen participation in these certifications. And uh, basically I, I told them that I wasn't a registered PE and uh, basically they said, well, then you can't be on the uh, PAC, Professional Engineering Advisory Committee. And I politely said, well, thank you. <laughs> so you know, with an outstanding record in the publication area, what motivated you to switch and refocusing into the engineering consulting business? Well. It's like everything else, money became, a large, money became a large factor in redirecting my career. In those days, working for a nonprofit was not really financially fulfilling. Uh, the greatest asset uh, that evolved with consulting was the extraordinary network of contacts in the US and global mining communities. Consulting firms around 1980, uh, 80s, rarely focused on marketing and business development at programs. Also, the large EPCM companies were looking for mining professionals with marketing skills, and again, a large network of contacts. Uh, chose to work with Golder Associates in Denver, headed by Bruce Kennedy, hired to work as a senior mining engineer, <laughs> and initiated the markings, marketing and sales functions. Subsequently, I worked on and off with Thyssen Mining Construction, Pincock, Barry Dobear. Pincock is where we work together. Yeah. Uh, ACZ Environmental Consultants, which was really great because I learned the te te terminology of the uh, environmental, and uh, now I could write fairly well in that business too. And finally, with Tetra Tech, which I retired in from uh, five years ago. Your resume also shows that you worked in the junior mining company sector. What was your experience in that area? Yeah. Uh, Minex was a client of Pincock, Allen, and Holt. And uh, with my strong marketing and sales background and a growing network of financial entity contacts, they asked me to join the group and head up the corporate development function. I first interviewed in Caracas in November 1993 during Hugo Chavez's first unsuccessful coup d'etat. The country was under martial law. The Minix guys smuggled me out of the Caracas airport and downtown for the interview, and I joined the group. The company's flagship property was the Oro Uno Gold Project, located in the Kilometer 88 gold region of Venezuela. Here we developed and constructed a demonstration CIL plant. I served on the negotiating team with financial entities, and we visited with Yorkton, McDermott St. Lawrence, uh, Gordon Capital. Ultimately, uh, the property was sold to Venezuelan gold fields, uh, Bob Freeland for 64 million Canadian cash and shares. Uh, reset the bar, went on to the next uh, venture uh, with a large contact network. We found that we found, found a share a shell company and initiated a reverse takeover process. 
Uh, my Minix contributed three South American properties to the new venture. Now, I knew nothing about reverse takeovers. I remember, Doug, uh, you said, I can help you. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, we, I, I remember showing you the, the structure of the company, and you suggested, well, keep these, keep these treasury shares, uh, you know, and gave me a plan. So we flew to Cleveland, Ohio for this shell company and negotiated. And I presented uh, verbatim what you told me to do. And you knew I was having the meeting because you said you gave me a number where you could be reached. <laughs> well, anyway, they counter offered me uh, and said, no, we don't want to do this. We want to do this, 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 this. So I remember I said, can we adjourn this meeting? And uh, we need the caucus because my three Venezuelan buddies were with me. And they said, OK, uh, take an hour. And I, I got back into our suite, and I remember calling you. And I said, well, this is what they said to me. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> and you gave me an alternative. And uh, rather amazingly, uh, they accepted the revised terms when we came back. And uh, all of a sudden, we, we created a new junior company by the reverse takeover method and were listed as a Vancouver Stock Exchange venture. During my time there, negotiated financing for $10 million Canadian working capital facility and established Anglo-Andean Explorations and served as its president and chief executive officer. I don't remember getting any founder shares in that. <laughs> we didn't even give you a finder's fee. No, you didn't. I think <laughs> you might have bought me a beer. But, but it was absolutely amazing because my peer group, you know, perception, is everything. Reality is nothing. And I remember people I knew said, you got that done already? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Doug. You're welcome.